What is it like in that writer's room? <laughs> What's the environment? Uh, you know, they used to have a saying, the soldiers in Vietnam used to have a saying about that being in Vietnam was long, long stretches of boredom punctuated by mo short moments of sheer terror. Oh my God! Oh my God. Ah! Ah! Simpsons is very much like that, except that rather than terror, it would be hilarity. So, but it's 95% boredom. Now, I gotta, I, I gotta explain that I haven't been in the writer's room with the Simpsons in over 20 years. So I can only tell you what it was like back then. Um, and back then, it was very different because we didn't have uh, cell phones, which has really changed everything. Like, you know, ch people now have, can communicate with the outside world or they can get news. They can communicate with their loved ones by cell phone. In, in the early 90s when we were there, you didn't have those things. So you were in there all day long with the same 10 guys, all guys, every day, all day with no break. Uh, except for lunch, which took an outsized role in our lives. <laughs> All the eating took an outsized role in our lives. I lost 65 pounds after I left The Simpsons. But uh, so, uh, so you didn't have anything to distract yourself other than food or, or work. And uh, so there was a lot, also there's smoking. You could smoke in the, this is, it sounds so antique, the idea that you could smoke at a workplace, but they didn't outlaw that till 1995. It sounds so like people, jury duty a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Schwarzmulder, when he was in the room, would smoke all day long. I smoked a little bit. I mean, that's kind of distracting, but like, it's fun. I think it's, it's, it's sounds fun and it is fun occasionally. Um, like, especially when Conan was in the room, he was really funny and he performed everything and he was manic. He was very much like his, his real life, his TV show. That's just, that's the way he is in real life. Um, so he always made it fun, but a lot of times it's just people sitting and thinking and they're like, okay, we need a name for this itchy and scratchy episode. And two minutes of silence, and then someone says, you know, how about Apocalypse Meow? <laughs> Maybe people chuckle, uh, and we keep going. And then finally, sometimes after over an hour, we'll get one that everybody laughs at, and that's the one that goes in the script. That's the way it was then. Um, so I wouldn't say that it was fun. Uh, it was rewarding when you came up with the right joke, or especially something that everyone loved and later you knew was going to be great. Um, but it wasn't like a day-to-day laugh you know laugh fest uh and it's also different it's very different today as i said with cell phones and not only that but with almost all tv show work being on zoom now it's a very very different type of thing what kind of landed you there what were you doing before that to to land on the simps in the simpsons writer room unimportably unemployed yeah. um so after you know josh my part when I, when I when i say we throughout this whole thing i mean me and josh josh weinstein my writing partner best mm -hmm. friend from high school um we knew we wanted to get into TV writing and we had a couple of, because we had worked on our college humor magazines and we actually had a high school humor magazine. We'd always been into stuff like National Lampoon, things like that. We wanted to go into comedy and, or, you know, get a job writing for David Letterman or Saturday Night Live or something like that. Um, we did get a couple of, we, we had a couple of real low paying jobs on a network called Ha, which later became Comedy Central. Uh, for like comedy game shows and stuff. And then we moved, we got hired to work on a TV show in LA, um, a friend of ours hired us and then it got canceled after three weeks. So we had moved to LA and we were horribly unemployed. And like, like you know, we we're getting literally getting unemployment checks and we we're like, we're gonna try to break into TV writing and, and writing to sitcom writing, which is a totally different world than what we had been in. So we wrote these spec scripts and spec scripts are what you have to write. You write a sample script. You guys know this, I assume, but mm -hmm. you write a sample script for an episode of a show that you like, and, and it shows that you can write, and then people send it around, and if you're lucky, you'll get a meeting or a job, maybe. So we had written a spec script for this show called Coach, <laughs> which you may remember, and maybe before your time, but it was a real middle-of-the-road sitcom about a coach <laughs> at a college football, uh, and it wasn't a show that we particularly liked, but our script was just, we we're like, this is just as good as an episode of Coach. <laughs> and it was, but no, nobody liked it for that reason. Until, and finally somebody said to us, uh, you know, guys, it's clear that you don't really like this show. <laughs> and <laughs> this is not going to get you any jobs. And so you got to write a show that you like. And we were like, okay, let's get, and this, at this point we had almost given up and I was going to apply. I already applied to get a job at the state department. And I was like, I want to, I'm going to go into the foreign service. And they sent me the foreign service exam. And it was so hard. I had no idea how hard it was going to be. And I was like, I don't know any of this stuff. I don't know about Azerbaijan. I don't know. Ah, oh, fuck. Get it. Okay. We'll write one more script. <laughs> so, and that was, so we decided to write one more script. And there was a show that had been on only like four or five episodes at that point called the Seinfeld Chronicles. 
which is what Seinfeld was called in its first four episodes. And we thought it was the funniest, best show on TV, best comedy on TV. And so we're like, okay, we're going to write a Seinfeld Chronicles. Nobody's heard of this show, but we love it, and we think we can write a good one. And we wrote one. We worked really hard to write an excellent episode of Seinfeld Chronicles, and it immediately <laughs> immediately took us off. It was amazing. Like, we had it. We immediately got an agent. The agent sent it around. We got meetings at every place, every place that was big back then. You cheers, Murphy Brown, all those places like that. And um, they even sent it to The Simpsons. And uh, that's, it also got read at Seinfeld. Later, later we found out as well. And um, at The Simpsons, Mike Reese and Al Jean, who we had met occasionally in the past, were running the show. And they decided, they read our script. Even the one of them, only one of them had ever even heard of Seinfeld at that point. And, and they gave us an assignment to write this episode, Marge Gets a Job, which was um, Conan's idea. And so we wrote this freelance episode uh, and it came out pretty good. And, and it was, you know, heavily, most Simpsons episodes are heavily rewritten. You're lucky if you get 20 or 30% of your material yeah, in there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we got about that amount. Um, and then that was it. And then, but we said these meetings, we finally got, we had all these other meetings, other shows. We actually got hired at a show that was a show um, from the creator of uh, Murphy Brown with Diane English had created a show called Love and War. And she'd hired us. And we were like, they were buying us a computer and everything. And we call our agent and said, hey, you know, this is great. We're so happy to have this job. Would you just call the Simpsons one more time and see if there's any chance that they would ever hire us? And he did. And they did. And it turned out because Jay Kogan and Wallace Wallardarski had just announced that they were going to leave. So there was a slot open there for our team. There was an office open and they're like, and Mike and now God bless them, gave us a shot. And like, and it literally came down to us. I don't think we would have gotten hired unless we said to our agent, would you just give them this, this one call? <laughs> and, and he did. And so it worked out. And then things happen. You know, you guys, if you know the Simpsons history, you know, all this stuff, like all those guys who had been there, we were, us and Cohen were the only people who had been hired new people that have been hired since the original crew was mm -hmm. there. And then the original crew all left like four months after we got hired. Perfect. So Conan <laughs> and Conan and us and Dan McGrath, who was hired later, were the only people on the show for several months. And then we, and then David Merkin came in to run the show and we were already the most senior people there after, you know, after seven months, then Conan suddenly got it. Conan was obviously going to be the next guy to run the show, but he suddenly got hired to be a famous talk show host and left. Again, so mm. so then we were the, we were literally the most senior guys on the show after having been there for about ten months, and we had a good. There was a, several strokes of luck involved in that, and basically during David Merkin's years, he just let us write episodes. Just write, let us write episodes all the time. We wrote five episodes each season, stayed in our office most of the time, and, and wrote those scripts. And then when Merkin decided he wanted to leave, he uh, thankfully we thankful him uh, recommended us for the job, and we took over. So there you oh. go. <laughs> That's, extra riches. <laughs> there's a lot of info in there before I know Mark's got a few questions. Why decide to write the, you know, the Seinfeld chronic episode instead of creating something new? I know it helped you get noticed, but why make that decision? And why didn't, if it got so many views, why didn't Larry David take you guys on since it was a hit? Well, interestingly, it wasn't a hit yet. Uh, Larry David didn't read it till years later. And he, Actually, no, he did. He did. Believe it or not, this we had a weird a couple of episodes. We had a weird relationship with Larry David because he did read it and he really liked it. And he actually said, this is the second best Seinfeld spec script I ever read. Wow. And then he asked us to come up with some ideas. And we did come up with the ideas. We pitched them to him on the phone. He didn't love any of the ideas. That was the last we heard from him. And then, then like two years later, he tried to hire us away from The Simpsons. Ooh. The Simpsons would not, we had a contract that we could not get out of with The Simpsons. Uh, so that never ended up happening. Would you so have wanted that. to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were having a bad time at the Simpsons at that point. So okay. we, we wanted to get out. But um, things change, obviously, when we took over. So uh, so that's that's kind of what happened with Larry David. Now, why? You know, back then, there was not so much desire to have uh, for special material. Like today, if you're trying to be breaking into TV writing, you got to have – I would say that you have to have at least one spec script and one original pilot okay. or something like that. And a lot of times people would get hired. These days can get hired from an original. But back then when it was TV writing was far more regimented and there were only like there were four networks, there were 45 shows on the air and that was it. And like you had to be able to produce in that format, like, you know, 
you had to be able to show that you could write an episode of Cheers, an episode of Murphy Brown or whatever in that format. People didn't give a shit about your ability to write something original. They wanted that you could produce their show. So at that time, now these days, because there's such a huge number of shows and people are definitely looking for original voices, it's almost, uh, you absolutely have to have an original original material. You can't just go around with your spec script for Silicon Valley or whatever and expect no. to get hired. You got to have both. 